Good. I don't know whether we had you before. Do you want to introduce? No, me? no. I haven't been on the on the Zoom meeting, but I've been following your YouTube channel for quite a while, and uh, I missed the last one, so I saw the recorded version of it, and you know, I was just uh, excited to be part of this and hope to be able to clarify some things. I have a lot of questions, and uh, well, we'll see. Uh, I'm excited to hear about what your research has been, uh, what you've been doing, and just looking forward to it. Excellent. Good to know. So there is a chat uh, capability where you can chat to individuals during the stream, and you can chat to everyone. And when the stream is finished, anything you put into the chat window will go into a script, which I'll be able to send as part of uh, an update to the posting on remoteview.icu. Sorry about the rumbling in the background, if you can hear that. Um, and so if you want to post contact details uh, for people to contact individuals uh, uh, and start discussing uh, with people um, directly, then drop, drop your contact details in there. If there's any questions you specifically want to ask, uh, again, drop into there. Okay, so um, I'll just give you an update of um, uh, what, what's going to happen over the next couple of months. Um, the, the first thing is that um, I uh, am going to be doing the company accounts uh, over the next week. That's not so interesting for you guys. It's one of my dull chores that I have to do every year um, as we are a, a not-for-profit uh, entity, but it is a, what's called uh, a community interest company in the UK. So we have to submit uh, all our uh, income and expenditure and do a full set of corporate accounts. So that has to be done. And as no one else is stupid enough to take on that burden, I, I tend to do that <laughs> every year. So I'm going to be doing that next week. And then um, uh, Slobodan uh, has quite graciously agreed to host me for six days uh, the following week at the beginning of August. And we are going to take a look at exposing this lump of um, calcium carbonate that was cut out of a mountain in uh, Vietnam where the finest quality calcium carbonate in the world comes from. And we can get this in mountain sized blocks. Now, if you look at the Parkamov reaction tables at nanosoft.co.nz, you can run the uh, tritium with calcium carbonate uh, and it takes the calcium 40 and the tritium, grabs a proton from the tritium and creates four helium, a gas, and produces 39 potassium. That is the most likely reaction with tritium in, in what I would consider a coherent matter state, uh, uh, which I believe is at the root of many, many phenomena, including uh, cold fusion. And uh, uh, I was not surprised to find that this guy agrees with me, and Lockheed Martin agree with me, and, and uh, many other scientists over the years uh, uh, for instance, uh, I recently discovered that Roger Stringham, uh, who has been doing ultrasonics uh, probably more than anyone since uh, um, uh, sonar fusion was discovered in the early part of the last century uh, than anyone else, um, he also believes it's a coherent matter phenomena. Anyway, so taking the most abundant calcium isotope 40, stripping a proton from it to produce the most abundant 13 in the crust rather, in the crust of 39 potassium, uh, I, I'm saying that not only does the Parkamov reaction tables, which are rudely good at, predict, uh, at uh, showing that historical linear, uh, uh, data is correct uh, after it's been published even many decades, it's also a good predictor of future re reactions. And my, my understanding that, that uh, the crust of the Earth is the, the biggest experiment on Earth, and it's been going for four and a bit billion years, the answer is in the crust. And so if 39 potassium is the most abundant uh, element of potassium and 40 calcium that we've got in this is the most abundant uh, uh, calcium and calcium does not generally like to transmute. Uh, it likes to stay stable. Uh, there's two modes. The second most likely reactions that the Parkamov table predict other than this four helium production and, and uh, 39 potassium are higher isotopes of calcium. And the beauty of calcium is it can accept a lot of neutrons before it becomes unstable. And so the other product would be protein uh, coming out and, and the calcium would be absorbing uh, neutrons. And so I'm very excited. Now, the problem that I have, 
with the experiments that I'm hoping to do with Slobodan is we've only got a small amount of deuterium and deuterium again like protein will not produce this potassium effect it's not predicted in the tables there's no reason for it to occur uh, however if we can get isotopic studies done of the potassium uh, sorry of the calcium carbonate that we expose to the uh, HHO and, and deuterium enriched HO. And by the way, I think the minimum capacity of your tank is two liters. Is that right for the electrolyzer? So we're only gonna be putting five milliliters of deuterium oxide in there. However, that will massively increase the amount of deuterium in there. So there might be a chance to see if we can get a technology to look at the, um, the uh, uh, um, isotopic ratio on here. Uh, that might be a potential option. And we've used this thing called Moldy uh, Toff Sims at the university up the road here, which is a matrix assisted laser dispersion ionization time of flight spectroscopy. And whilst it only sees ions above 90, what we'll be looking is for ions that, that in the original material and then ions in the exposed material uh, to the deuterium enriched. And we'll be seeing if there's an increase in uh, calcium because the, the deuterium should produce uh, higher isotopes of calcium if the Parkamore tables are correct. If, we, if that happens, it's, it, from my, in my opinion, it's an absolute slam dunk. We can use this basic electrolyzation uh, uh, producing a Brown's gas or an Amasa gas or, or a, a standard uh, uh, HHO uh, technology, burn it on the um, the, the potassium, uh, sorry, calcium carbonate, uh, and uh, remove uh, uh, neutrons and uh, remove the tritium from the water. So quite quite excited about that. Um, and so I will be doing at least the testing with uh, Slobodan. I don't know if Slobodan, um, you have your contacts at. Uh, EPFL and whether they would be willing uh, or have a technology that they could uh, allow us to use and if it needs to be paid for let's find out what the cost of that is if you can work on that in this coming week because um, it would be interesting if we could do it back to back i.e., do the test and, and get, a, get a quick answer uh, fr from them. Uh, so, so we can we can do a fast cycle on our experimentation. I understand if you can't do it, it's always difficult to get these things, especially when everyone's on holiday in Europe. But hopefully, everyone's doing a staycation, and they might come into the to the lab to um, uh, give us a a bit of their time. And so, if you can if you can look at uh, whether it, do you have a good you you seem to have a quite a good relationship with them. Oh, okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, so yeah, I've uh, already worked with them about the uh, um, spectral, anal an spectral analysis and also the uh, Raman spectrography, also with the uh, gas chromatography with the uh, different samples. So yeah, I, um, as you said, uh, um, they're working. I suppose they're coming back uh, slowly. Uh, uh, at the university right now, so uh, I will take a, a call. Uh, I think tomorrow to see if uh, what is possible to do and when it's possible to do. What is the uh, time lapse that uh, they have? Uh, they need to, to do all the, these analyses, especially uh, the uh, the analysis with the uh, isotopes. So we'll see. Yeah, I understand that. Um, uh, quadrupole and octopole uh, and even higher uh, mass spectrometry has a problem because often they use argon in the reactor and that is a mass 40 and so that um, swamps the signal uh, when you're looking at uh, changes in mass 40 uh, mm -hmm. and so um, that that can be a problem uh, I, I, I we can't if, if we could get access to some tritium water uh, which is basically not going to happen but if we could um, then we could actually use just EDS because we, we would be looking for the uh, increased uh, abundance of potassium in there but anyway we, we, two we liter don't of need to guarantee sorry what I said two liters tritium water would be great so yeah that would be awesome yeah 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 just don't, don't breathe it in uh, or drink it um, <laughs> the tonic you want um yeah so uh, it's it's just uh, the only way to guarantee failure is to not to try so we've got we've got to at least uh, uh try and since uh, america is not letting anyone in 
from um, the US, uh, from Europe or the UK, uh, we can't possibly uh, go and uh, do any form of testing with the Browns guests. So thank you very much for agreeing to accommodate me. Like I say, I've got the tickets, but um, the, the the challenge is uh, I, I my, my six months of, of my antibodies from that were more than a year old from my infection between uh, April and, or March into April last year with the original bug, the more deadly version, um, uh, they run out on the 8th. So I'll be coming back on the 7th. So, or the sixth. So, I want to give myself a day leeway when my my uh, six month uh, validity of my not not that anyone cares about T cell immunity, but uh, I, I don't want to be as Swiss, as lovely as, and beautiful as Switzerland is. I don't want to be trapped there or somewhere en route to <laughs> back to the Czech Republic. So, uh, you know, it was nice that you offered the extra day, but I think I'm going to um, um, get away a little bit sooner. I I, I don't. The, the, the nonsense that I went through, for, for those that have decided not to travel, you've probably done yourself a favour. But I have to say, despite the extreme discomfort and the fascist state interference and the 16 tests costing about $1,200 over 23 days and the 10 days in incarceration in a 200 metre square piece of land, it was very worth good while going to the UK. And for those that don't know, uh, and that's probably most of you. I uh, uh, took the opportunity to arrange to visit four collectors of John Hutchison materials. And uh, I actually acquired some samples um, and I am gonna show a couple of those to you now. Um, so the first one um, actually, uh, so th th there's a, a couple of the collectors and um, this guy wants to remain private. Uh, he has some of the most important samples. So uh, the one that you saw in the trailer image and that's on the remote view to ICU uh, um, uh, image was the, the um, as I understand it, is the molybdenum billet that was provided by a member of a part of the US uh, armed forces as a challenge to John Hutchison to see if he could bend it. And I can tell you it's about an inch and a half. I guess it's, it's like maybe... I, I guess four centimeter diameter uh, rod, I guess it's about maybe uh, 10 inches long. And, 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 and I'm gonna mix my units up here, but anyway, <laughs> uh, 25 centimeters, no, maybe yeah, 25 centimeters long and about four centimeters diameter. And um, uh, I think they gave it to him as like, you know, you're not gonna be able to bend this. So let's see if you can. <laughs> You're not going to be able to bend it conventionally because it's not long enough to get any leverage uh, in any kind of device you could possibly imagine. Uh, and uh, uh, he did it. Uh, now, um, one could look at looking at the marks and I, I've got this at 50 megapixels, the image which will be in the book. And I'm going to talk about the Kickstarter as well uh, during this this conversation here. Um, because I'm going to be launching that after I get back um, from visiting Slobodan. Uh, the the um, uh, the material, when you look at it, and I've done, looked at it with a microscope as well, briefly when I was with the, the person that possesses it, uh, it, it, you could imagine it's like large electro uh, discharge machining marks, but then that is exactly what ball lightning looks like. It's these hemispherical pieces of material that are removed from the sample. And uh, it, there was a person on our live, last live Zoom call who has been looking into this and, and, and piggybacking off the research that the MFMP has done over the last few years. And uh, he, he has uh, some interesting contacts that have been working with him. And they believe that these, uh, what I believe is this coherent matter is able to go in and disrupt the, uh, uh, he says the D and the F subshells. And they, they think they've theoretically proven that and they've got experiments to show it. And if you can imagine that this is going into the molybdenum and affecting those uh, uh, subshells, I, I think it, maybe it's I think it's heavy enough to have those, uh, uh, maybe not, but um, uh, I think it should have D. Um, uh, anyway, the, the point being is that it's it's disrupting the way the electrons bind, and uh, it's interesting that it is bending. Um, I don't know whether this is significant, but it's bending in the away from the area which is most affected, even on the image that I've shared you. So on the other side of, of that sample, there's much less uh, um, affected area uh, and, it, and it's bending away from that. So I, 
uh, in a similar vein, um, he gave me this sample, which I think is really rather special. Um, uh, and you may have seen uh, this uh, sample in other uh, uh, images that John has shared over the years. And, and I don't expect to find anything different that we haven't already seen in the coral twist and in uh, the uh, aluminium fracture sample. So I'm not gonna be looking to spend resources on analyzing this. However, he also gave me, so, so uh, uh, this is a loaned sample. And John has said that this was tested, I think by the US universities or German and or U German universities. A number of people apparently have tested this sample uh, and it, it is a very interesting fracture pattern. But um, the, the material on here is claimed to have been uh, uh, undetectable as a normal element. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, um, uh, I, uh, there's an introduction here. I sat next to uh, Anatoly Klimov in the day, the morning after the end of the Sochi 2018 presentation. And he was um, lamenting with a military person that was opposite him to him. One of the challenges with Lena and the data that comes from Lena is that they get all these materials that don't appear to be any element in the periodic table. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you look, I've mentioned this guy before, Barkler. Barkler actually discovered the uh, uh, characteristic x-rays. And this is what, when you fire an electron beam at a sample in an e in EDS, you get these um, electrons in the metal being uh, promoted to a higher orbital. And they then drop down and they cre create a, an x-ray that comes back. And that is the characteristic x-ray that you get from an element. And you get a number of these from various elements. Uh, uh, and they give a signature as to what the element is. And the, Thomas Barkler was the person that uh, also found what he called jade radiation. And he spent, after he got the Nobel Prize, he basically spent the rest of his life trying to work out what jade radiation is. And I believe jade radiation is the strange radiation which you get when you have a buildup of coherent matter in the metal, and then it gets disrupted and you get coherent matter wave beam coming out and expresses itself in electronics as other frequencies of uh, um, X-ray. Anyway, um, he was, when, when you understand, and I've talked about this before, the paper by, um, uh, by Rudzkev et al. And I think it was, I think it was 2003, somewhere between 2003 and 2005, six, when he's talking about the, the fast um, uh, failure of the uh, Chernobyl RBMK reactor. He's saying that the, the turbine was held as part of the tests and then it discharged. When you do the math, it turns out of many, many orders of magnitude of instantaneous uh, uh, energy release um, compared to the uh, S.V. Adamenko tests in Proton 21 labs in, um, uh, uh, in the old uh, isotopic factory outside Kiev where he was able to transmute matter every single time and saw strange radiation tracks. And that has been discussed by, by Sotsky, I think also in 2003. But anyway, he's saying that these are going into the water and in specifically into the oxygen in the water. And I talked about how the fact that oxygen is this uniquely paramagnetic material uh, compared to all other elements that are even anywhere near close. And it goes into the oxygen. I believe that this is also uh, relative to how uh, HHO Brown's gas and Amasa gas works. And then it goes through the pipes. And in that paper, which I fully shared, uh, he describes how the pipes on the wall, they burst off the wall. And he's effectively saying that the pipes became an intensely magnetic fluid. And that then this ended up with the electrical things coming off the wall. And then these magnetic monopoles, which uh, he believes are magnetically charged uh, uh, cold neutrinos, uh, which have been synthesized by this process, go into also the oxygen that's in the air. And when you look at the, there was thousands of people at Chernobyl that witnessed this odd glow above the reactor. Uh, it's witnessed by the military people and by the people that lived in Prepriac. And uh, it's kind of, they, they try and attempt to show it on the uh, uh, wonderful, but completely inaccurate uh, HBO doc documentary. And it's this glow that comes out of the top of the reactor. Now, um, the reason it would seem uh, odd to humans is humans spend their entire existence observing what is normal and uh, uh, basic um, ionization of air. 
So all of their experience will be normal ionization of air by, from whatever means. So their frame of reference was never in their collective consciousness when they saw what was above that reactor. What was above that reactor, and it's stated in the uh, Reutzke paper, is these magnetic monopoles. They're trapped, in my, I believe, primarily onto the oxygen. And this, just like it does in metals, and we've observed this in the Lion reactor and in a number of different Lena samples, that you can test the material before and it looks like the elements you put in, like all the characteristic X-rays have come back. But then you look at the Lion reactor and you get these weird things coming back. And it's like, well, hold on a minute. They're not even elements. <laughs> and this is the same thing that was being discussed when people tried to analyze John Hutchison. This is absolutely, definitely, and certainly the exact same effect. And so um, uh, there's, an, there's another data point that I shared probably in the beginning of 2018 when I was leading into um, the uh, translation of uh, Parkhamov's book. And this was Xu Wenju's work from 1988 through to 1999, where during a three-body alignment, which will, as we know now, he didn't know the mechanism back then, but we know now that this will lens and it will refract and it will uh, uh, diffract and it will cause a variation in the uh, density of the flux of cold neutrinos from the cosmos. And he found that all elements gave an incorrect spectrum during a three body alignment. So here you have three data points, uh, plus our own experience with multiple samples and the John Hutchison samples. That are, uh, and John, remember, um, Ken Shoulders is saying that in metals, these things stay indefinitely. And so there's no reason to expect that this won't be the case when I look at it. Now, this might not be the sample that he's referring to, but I think John, I'm hoping John will join the call actually. Uh, he said he's gonna to try to, so that would be great. He could, he could confirm the provenance of these particular samples if he is able to join. But anyway, he's keen to join us in one of these calls as, as soon as that is uh, going to be possible. Um, so I, I think we've got a situation where uh, it, the, 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 the thing that, um, uh, Klimov was lamenting this, this uh, inability to show the elements that you are actually, uh, you can physically see. I mean, I can touch this, I can touch this, I can touch the lion reactor. Like, here, here is the lion reactor, I can touch it, it's uh, physically there. It, I mean, my finger doesn't pass through it, but, but the normal uh, technologies to detect the elements do not see them. And, and the same thing was said actually uh, uh, um, uh, about Ormus. You can't detect Ormus materials. They don't detect as the elements you put in. I think this is all the same uh, uh, thing. When David Hudson was talking about the fact that they used all the kind of normal analysis techniques to uh, uh, try and determine what these elements were, um, uh, I think he's bang on the money. He's created like the, the, the product that you get out of Lena. And if you look at what Synthesis, Synthesis is doing, um, who actually did some of the testing for us when I was in Sochi, Sochi they are actually creating uh, effectively Ormus type uh, elements, na nascent uh, new elements, uh, and that is their claim. Although, uh, I, I, you know, th they're selling it for a particular reason, which is avoiding uh, treading on the toes of the en energy industry in Russia. So I I'm quite excited about this. So the, the John Hutchison book, um, uh, so I'm going to announce it here for the first time, what it's going to be. There's going to be the... Uh, short biography which will be revealing all kinds of things that no one has ever known about John Hutchison okay and and explains some of the behaviors that you may think are odd or, or quirky uh, and and why that is it has a, a vastly long history and and uh, some some things about his uh, what happened to his mother particularly uh, with government experiments and so forth and and the, the what his father did which uh, enabled him to study at, at an early age and, and so on. He has a, a unique kind of history that uh, enabled him to be the person to do this. So that, that's going to be absolutely spectacular uh, uh, um, sort of uh, information and, and context around what, what made the man that did this, okay? So these, these, these people don't come along every day. And then secondly, we're going to be, um, uh, as much money as can be raised, uh, that will improve the, the level of analysis we can do. Now, we've already got a lot of analysis done. We've got part of that analysis shared and, and, and so on. So, um, and I want to look more at the isotopic levels um, and to see if this pattern of, of uh, um, increased production of, uh, new, uh, of um, 
fermion, fermionic isotopes carries forward. So um, there's that. And that, that whole book, that, that first book will be black and white. Um, that keeps the cost down and, and, and will allow uh, many poor people to see it in the future. Uh, there will be a secondary book, and, and, uh, which, which will be a larger, much larger format book, where I will be taking extremely uh, in, uh, beautiful uh, full color images of the samples from multiple angles. And then having the breakdowns with, with the color uh, SEM maps and, and so forth, uh, something that you really can't achieve in, in something that you're carrying around with them. So the, the, the core data and a black white image of the sample and discussion around it will be in the other book. The other one will be something that you can put on a coffee table and people can uh, uh, commit to one or other or both as, as a package uh, and so forth. Now that, 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 is, that is the principal thing that I want to achieve. This is really to document the man and, and to deliver to John and the wider community uh, something that John has always wanted to be public. He fought for three decades to get the analysis done that was done by the military in various countries uh, of his samples to become public and, and that's not going to happen. So uh, this is going to happen this way. So I'm, I'm really excited about that part of the project. If there's, there's intended to be two stretch goals, the first stretch goal is uh, to capture in high quality uh, and to correct any uh, um, historical problems with, with, with the material. All of the private letters he's received from people like Sakharov, Shoulders, uh, uh, you name it, there's some amazing letters there. And to put that into a database that will be accessible from the, uh, um, the MFMP's uh, events, uh, Lena events database. Uh, so, you, for the, so that would be for the public good, but uh, and all of the public, uh, for, straight from the bat, if we can achieve that stretch goal, and to also capture all of his videos and make those available uh, at least online in a small format, and maybe as a package uh, uh, for people to to get uh, for as a as a resource uh, long long term. And so um, uh, he he has terabytes of material, but they, they weren't necessarily done with the right uh, capturing equipment. I, I purchased some equipment. I've got, I actually set up a business a number of years ago, transferring old formats to DVDs. I would do it differently, um, but I have a huge, immense amount of experience in, the, in precisely this process of capturing old formats, converting them, and where appropriate, I will look to upscale to HD, HD and, and, and depending on what's in the budget, and, and uh, um, uh, I'll, I will have the original footage and the upscaled version. So the original footage uh, uh, would be uh, without problems. I, I can see on some of his videos, and I've discussed this with John, things that look like transparency are where there has been a change between one format to another, and it's it's a, a, a frame interpolation problem that's caused what appears to be an effect, and it's not actually an effect. And I've seen this uh, in problems that I've had historically going back to the 90s when I was doing a lot of video work. So um, I, I, I want it to be authentic and true, whatever's done there. So that's the first stretch goal. And the second stretch goal is going to be to um, produce, to, he, he is the only person that is known to have produced the Tesla disruptive discharge generator. And this was a unit that was built by Tesla so he could demonstrate his effects uh, on the road. He could go to somewhere and demonstrate all the core effects on the road. And, uh, to, and, and John says that this was critical to all of his uh, uh, major experiments. And uh, um, it requires getting these uh, um, huge transformer uh, uh, um, ceramic isolators uh, but the, uh, other than that, uh, it, it's, I want to actually document the whole making. So taking Tesla's plans, using John's experience of actually making this thing and making this thing that actually did the job that, that John achieved and, and uh, document that whole process as a package. So that's the second stretch goal. And I think we'll, we'll leave it there as, as far, you know, I, the, the book is the most important thing. The analysis uh, in that book, uh, I think, is what, what the community can learn from the most. And, and then uh, making sure that his documents and his videos are not lost uh, and, and end up in some landfill somewhere would just be a, a, a huge tragedy. And also not stuck in some Pennsylvanian university uh, 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 with, with much of it embargoed for 50 years, like a lot of the material of uh, uh, Ken Shoulders. So uh, I want this to be public from the get-go. Um, so that is that is a review, and that's uh, 
what I am intending to do. Uh, Alan Goldwater is running a LEC experiment. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that was, um, I, I can't remember his name. I'm going to remember his name, but this is a, a it, it's a, 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 they don't know whether it's Lena. It may be Lena, but it produces a low voltage continuously uh, from uh, putting deuterium in there. So he's, he's uh, doing the co-deposition part of that process at the moment, and there'll be more uh, messaging on that in uh, the coming weeks and months. And so uh, quite excited about that. Uh, obviously, what I'm doing with Slobodan is feeding into the proposal uh, for the work uh, uh, to present to uh, um, Fukushima. I I'm going to see if we can leverage two aspects. One, one is um, uh, we had a discussion last night with, with the team, and uh, we have worked with Vysotsky in the past. Vysotsky has already uh, been working with, the, uh, at least at one point, and I've had a discussion about this with him, with the, the uh, Fukushima uh, and TEPCO with review to his uh, biological remediation of soil and so on. But uh, this will not fix uh, tritium. It will only fix cesium-137 and, and, and strontium-90, those kind of elements. It's not going to fix the tritium uh, because there's no reason for the bacteria and the yeast to, to want to do that transmutation. Uh, they don't need they they don't need helium to build their cell by adding <laughs> by adding a proton, but they they can add a proton to cesium one thirty seven to make barium uh, 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 one thirty eight, which is stable and, and a calcium analog. So they can, they can actually use that, and that's that's why the biology does that transmutation. It's advantageous to it. So that's one angle. The other angle is to uh, reach out to Francesco Cellani. Obviously, Francesco Cellani uh, uh, is the first person we replicated, and as part of that. Uh, uh, what came out of that, we, we did, did some representations to the EU, and now there are many universities in two groups across the EU that have got funding in, in part because of that, and one of those is the group that uh, Francesco Cellani's uh, heads up, and you may or may not know that Francesco Cellani's uh, wife is Japanese, he has a very good relationship with the Japanese, and so uh, I'm hoping that we can have multiple inroads uh, attack points uh, to try and get our proposal through to them. And, and if we fail, we fail uh, because, you know, uh, we've done our best. We just got to try and do our best uh, and, and see if there's, a, there's an ear that will be willing to listen. If we can get to Japan, uh, obviously there's restrictions on getting to Japan as well. Uh, otherwise, I would have been doing more of this with, no offense, uh, Slobodan, but it would have been with, <laughs> with uh, the Amaza gas uh, to continue that thread forward. Um, but uh, if we can get there, then we have three options. We have the Browns gas unit, which we have an option to buy uh, um, it, that's currently orphaned and not un untested, but uh, at least in a reasonably good working state in the US. We have uh, Slobodan's device, which I, I, I understand that he would be willing to uh, be part of the team uh, uh, to come and, and do uh, that with his device. And we have a Mars gas uh, devices as well. So we've got three different devices we can put to work to test. I actually think, and I've discussed this in our last uh, stream or a, a previous stream on this, that I believe, or I've certainly discussed it with my Japanese uh, uh, colleague, that, that the Amaza gas vibrator plates, whilst they are 56% efficient, and Slobodan, if, if, if he needs to correct me, but I think it's around about 76% your device is efficient. But if you're trying to try, uh, process tons of material a day, it may lose efficiency rather rapidly. Whereas the, the whole point about the Amaza vibrator plates is they are cl self-cleaning. Um, and so they, they don't have this buildup. So whilst it might be a lower efficiency initially, it might be the same efficiency after several months. And this is specifically the problem that they isolated in the 2019 uh, paper presenting all of the options for fixing Fukushima. So, um, but if we can prove at least part of the principle uh, at, with Slobodan in, in the coming weeks, um, then, then we'll be in a good position to say, look, th this does the job, and 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 this this device, which is Japanese homegrown, using the knowledge knowledge and proof from another Japanese guy, this guy Takaaki Matsumoto, you can you can solve this Japanese problem with Japanese solutions and Japanese scientists that have been trying to say, say this is the way you, you do it for many years. And you then provide a solution to other nuclear reactors around the world that currently dump their tritium water into the oceans. And so rather than, than, than uh, Japan using the fact that other nations dump the water into the oceans as an excuse to say, well, they're doing it, so why can't we? 
um, uh, we want to turn that on its head and say, why don't you provide a solution and, and show a leading position in this and, and then uh, um, show the way forward where it can economically and maybe even provide a, a economic benefit if you use the technology moving forward. Anyway, I've said my bit there. Um, so uh, if people have got questions and they want to ask questions, uh, if, if Slobodan wants to come in or if anyone wants to talk about anything, that's it. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty much out of the major things that I, I want to talk about uh, in this session. So far away, just raise your hand and, and, and ask or whatever you like. <laughs> yeah, hi, it's, it's Gert here. Um, okay. Yeah, so it's great. Uh, you know, I already watched some of Fisotsky's work about trying to clean up the radiation mass and some early videos from the 90s where he tried to explain stuff about how his processes could uh, could clean up uh, the radiation mass. But, you know, I had a question about something you said earlier about um, some of the Hutchinson samples containing things that seem not to be elements of the periodic table. So, so I'm wondering then, like, what are they then? I mean, do, do, does that imply that you know they they're not in the same configuration of quarks as as regular mat material, or do they not abide to the to the nuclear forces, or like so, what, what so, does it what does it concretely mean? So I, I think what it is is the, the the whatever is doing these Lenner effects is affecting electrons, and also electrons can interact with neutrinos, and neutrinos are the thing that causes protons to become neutrons and neutrons to become protons. So mm -hmm. uh, the fact that this is occurring, that they're all in sync with each other. Now, these uh, magnetically charged neutrinos or um, uh, what the Russians call uh, and Georgia Lo Loshats call uh, the Loshaks monopole, they, they do act like um, a, uh, a, a monopole. Uh, and I believe and I've described how buildups of these monopoles into a super monopole uh, can be why you get Hutchison effects, effects doing these kind of things, particularly along crystal grains in aluminium and uh, actual fracturing uh, completely across large billets like uh, in, yeah. in, in with magnetic materials uh, and, and paramagnetic materials. So um, the, 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 so uh, the, there was a guy on the last call and you can go and look at the, uh, the shared recording of that, the last Zoom shared recording. And uh, he's David. Uh, he he has um, let's put it. He's he's worked in the industries that should know a lot of stuff that is not public. Um, let's put it that way. And um, uh, he he says that um, they've established that it's affecting the DNF shells. Whatever, it's obviously affecting electrons uh, 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 in the shells of of the material. Uh, however, they're configured. Uh, whether you you consider it as the the Bohr model, um, that's easier to think about the the promotion to a higher uh, energy orbit and when those drop down to the lower energy orbit as they de-excite this produces this x-ray and it's this x-ray this characteristic x-ray uh, which was the uh, um, signature that, ta uh, uh, that Graham Barkler uh, uh, established uh, as the means to detect elements and that is what we all use when we use uh, um, wave, wave uh, wavelength dispersive spectrometry uh, WDS or mm -hmm. uh, 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 what do you call it EDS in when you've got a um, uh, scanning electron microscope so it is the, the, the nucleus uh, it, unless it is changed <laughs> Uh, which is possible with this technology as well, and 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 I, I, I probably at this juncture, and I should I should read uh, the two paragraphs from Matsumoto. We'll just hold on that because if you haven't heard it before, it's very critical. The this the the conclusion which is in the par uh, preface of his book, but um, essentially, if your electrons are um, forced to uh, arrange themselves differently, as David Hudson would claim. Um, they they uh, are when they are promoted, they don't give out the X-ray that you expect. So the nucleus may actually be, say, an iron nucleus. So let's say this mm -hmm. is an iron nucleus. Um, yeah. But when it gets excited, the electrons go in there. Even even the the beam of electrons going in there behaves differently. It interacts with the the um, the. It's like a bound state. They say that these uh, magnetically charged. Uh, 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 monopoles, these the, these uh, uh, neutrino clusters, they they bind to the nucleus, 
And so they affect the way electrons go in and the way that they, they can excite the electrons and the electrons are maybe in a different or, orbital structure and they present different photons. And so what I've experienced when I was looking at a, a Lion reactor uh, aftermath, particularly Lion 1, was that it was almost in, in, uh, incident angle, but not necessarily. But um, you would get this situation, two, two major effects. There, there was one which I, I called, um, I think it was... Uh, Schrodinger's cut uh, at, um, and the reason was is you you, you were firing um, the electron gun into the sample, and you didn't see anything. You didn't see anything. You didn't see anything, and suddenly it was like forty or thirty percent carbon, and then it just completely went away, and it, it didn't happen and didn't happen. And you can hear on the video uh, the the operator of the the SEM saying, I, I, "I'm sorry, I don't know what's happening. This has never happened before." I, I can't explain it. And she was trying to find out if she'd done something wrong. But when you understand that carbon is the main thing that these things synthesize, as you can mm -hmm. see with, with the potassium hydroxide, one millimeter lead, 200 volts and short pulses of AC, which produces HHO, of course, in light mm -hmm. water. When you look at this image here in Matsumoto's book, which is nearly at the end, you have this uh, um, uh, lead sphere, this lead sphere, okay? And these things like to produce lead. And mm -hmm. that is 204, 206, uh, uh, 7, and 8 uh, uh, nucleons. And then out of it, you've got this spew of carbon. This is a spewing out of the pole of this sphere. And carbon is obviously 12, 13, and 14 uh, uh, nucleons. And so you can get a lot of 12 out of the core of this um, uh, from those very heavy lead elements. So what we know is that these structures, they transport or they synthesize and they transport carbon. And this, Yul Brown said that when he's treating radioactive material or whatever it is, it mostly ends up as carbon. This is exactly his observation. It's the observation of Leclerc and it's what we observed in many different systems. And so if it is transporting carbon and we know that this can wrap material like a normal ball lightning can wrap material and transport it through other things when that thing blows up either deliberately or otherwise um uh, you, it will spill its guts and in the case of ken shoulders he said that these things can live in metals indefinitely so if i'm looking at my copper oxide on the outside of my line reactor and i'm shooting high energy electrons into it it's exciting those things that are indefinitely in the uh, um in the metal and ken shoulders specifically said that they stay in there indefinitely until it, unless I intentionally blow them up. So yeah. when we saw that thing occurring with this, this spew of carbon, I thought, well, the carbon's coming from uh, uh, exotic vacuum objects that are, or, or, or these uh, uh, itonic clusters that are stuck in the copper. And it's just going, one, one of them is exploding. Those, those uh, carbon ions are, are producing a lot of uh, x-rays that you would normally see from carbon 12, and it's picking it up as a sudden burst and then it completely disappears again. So um, I put that out there to, to, in uh, the hope that people could con connect the dots uh, way, way early on in January 2018, uh, to see, or maybe early February 2018, to see if people can connect the dots. So that's that's one thing. They can they can spew elements that 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 are trapped in the in the in the otherwise the matrix on the material. So they're actually like synthesizing them. At well, the moment, or... well, it could be synthesizing. It, it could be that there's an itonic cluster in there, or a microball lightning, or an exotic vacuum object, whichever term you like to choose, and that they're sitting in there, and and you excite them. And I haven't gone into this, but the the way I believe that you can reinvigorate these things is to energize them and if you energize them they might be so so if you look at what i shared in sochi in 2018 it was a slide referring to some work that was presented in oh sorry a, an interview with the american anti-gravity society um in 2006 and in this uh, uh, uh interview you you had uh, sv adamenko saying that on some of their accretion discs they found these uh, uh, I, I, these areas where if they, they were using secondary iron mass spectrometer, so they were firing uh, ions at high energy into mm -hmm. these areas, and they weren't seeing any secondary ions. And interestingly, they weren't seeing any primary ions. And so what that means is that it's disappearing. And then they turned the, the photomultiplier off, and they saw this glow 
uh, after they fire in these ions in, which exponentially decayed. And they repeated this over and over. And when they looked at it, they also found the smaller circles around this central big circle where the same phenomena occurred. And so what you're getting is you are getting what looks like Hawking radiation. And it, you're getting the absorption of the primary ions uh, going into the material. And so, uh, but if you imagine you shot so much energy at a single point, and it and and it you are effectively building up its energy. It's eating everything. It's coming in, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then exactly what he says in here, it gets to a point where it novas, and what it produces is carbon. So it may not be that the carbon is trapped inside. Is that you are exciting an exotic vacuum object, yeah. iconic cluster, and, uh, or, or micro ball lightning in the material to a point that it expands, it absorbs material around it, and then it does this self-compression collapse process, and it produces the, ob the observable thing you see is carbon. Why? Because on an EDS device, that's the lightest element you can all, all yeah. see. You can't see anything lighter than that. It might be producing proteum, almost certainly, because that is what was observed in, in the bulb development of uh, Langmuir in the 1910s. Um, it's almost certain that helium is produced, but you wouldn't be observing that because you can't excite it and, and, and get an x-ray back. You can't get it. It just doesn't happen. Lithium is the first thing that you, I think you can mm -hmm. get any kind of x-ray, but most EDS uh, do not detect anything below carbon. So when this thing blows up, that's what you see. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I think that's an appropriate point to just, uh, uh, for those that may not have had it, but, but to go over it again, he's saying here, Far in the universe, nuclear collapses very often take place by the gravitational force after stars consume their fuel. Since the electromagnetic force is about 40 orders stronger than the gravitational force, it should be easy to induce similar nuclear collapses by the electromagnetic force in the laboratory. But we never knew until now how to do that. Recently, the author discovered a nuclear collapse which was induced by the electromagnetic force in the laboratory during studying the mechanisms of so-called cold fusion phenomena. Several kinds of nuclear reaction were directly induced by the electromagnetic force called electronuclear reactions, ENRs. They were found so far to occur in a special state of hydrogen clusters he called itonic clusters or micro ball lightning. The nuclear collapse was one of the most remarkable reactions uh, among ENRs called EN electronuclear collapse, ENCs. Furthermore, very amazingly, completely broken materials by ENC were found to be regenerated again to thin tubes and films of conventional elements such as carbon, oxygen, and iron. The latter process was called electronuclear regeneration. Okay, so I'm describing what I showed in that Schrodinger's cat was something was in that material that when I excited it, I created a scenario where shoulders intentionally blew up these things that stay indefinitely in the metals occurred and we get the only product we can ordinarily see which is carbon mm -hmm. now that is that is where you see things that are, are not meant to be in there when you see things that aren't in there at all uh, i sorry aren't in the mendeleev table yeah this is this thing where you have uh, these ionization at uh, the exciting levels and it falls down and you and you can see it on some of the data I've shared in the past you you have for instance the, the now there is some band overlap with between some of these elements mm -hmm. but the the software is determining I don't know what this percentage of this material is but it looks like yttrium and actually several people have observed yttrium coming out of various reactors but it's not yttrium it's probably the, the copper but with a, a, a shift on the X-ray. And the shift on the X-ray is, in my view, what is being caused by uh, uh, the uh, uh, magnetically bound states of, of these magnetically charged cold neutrino condensates. Yeah. But like, there's no way to actually measure or observe those elements that are in that state. They, we can only observe what they synthesize or like what comes out of it when you energize them when you well, say what we are literally unbelievably three decades on right at the birth of this science we we, we are what these things will be characterized over time when people get off their uh, hobby horses that, that this can't exist 
you know, and therefore, because my 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 university, as I as I was told at, at Aarhus University, this is impossible. And if you want to know how impossible it is, go and read a textbook. That's literally what I was told. <laughs> and it's like, oh my god! You, yeah. you mean at some point in time that that science ended, and then it's just education and what the science is? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's completely bonkers that someone that, that would actually verbalize that and think they're quite bright. You know, it's like, oh. and and it, it, he didn't know that things like this existed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I didn't actually at the time. He he specifically had the beef with biological transmutations, and and and, and to give him credit, uh, you know, until the Indians had tried things on a a a, a, a couple of days spread using the seed germination. Some people had had success. They'd seen the change in the calcium and the potassium ratio and others hadn't. Mm -hmm. And it's because the moon, the moon in certain phases causes a different flux of cold neutrinos, in my opinion. And I'll tell you something right now, right now. Two things have happened today. One, this incredible storm we've just had outside. But earlier I was in the garden picking some vegetables and the, all of the ants were flying today. And I said to my children, all of these ants from all of the colonies, all over an immense area. Now, people would say oh, it's pheromones and whatever, and it travels through the wind. And probably there is a component to that. But at some point, one ant colony decides that this is the day that they're going to start coming out the ant, you know, and then they spread their pheromones and everyone agrees that this is the day. But maybe it isn't like that. Maybe it's like those oysters that they took from Japan. They put them in a, an electromagnetically sealed box, which was light tight. They flew them to the other side of the planet in, I think it was in North America somewhere, inland. And then the oysters opened up at the local tide time. They're not exposed to light. They're on a different side of the planet and they've just been in a plane, right? Something is getting into that container that is telling them that the tide is up. Now, we know 100% now that uh, the, 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 these, uh, uh, these cold neutrinos are affected by gravity. So why does the tide go up and down? It's because of change in gravity caused by the influence of the moon. Why did the, in, the Indian 2013 study uh, in seed germination observe in certain phases of the moon that the, the difference in these potassium calcium ratio because of cold neutrino flux from the cosmos. I believe Simon Schnoll is right. His 2012 book looking at, at papers from the 1950s, I think it's 2000 papers he looked at from the 1950s onwards, says all random processes on earth are, have a same, the same cosmo uh, physical factor. Uh, the active agent, he, re he refers it to, to it as. And that is in the paper, the presentation I gave, uh, in, I translated from Sochi. Uh, uh, by Shishkin, which is talking about the production of these uh, magneto uh, tor electrical radiation, which are possibly clusters of cold, uh, <laughs> cold neutrinos. Every, everything is the same thing. Uh, and it's it literally, it's, it's, it, it, everyone is affected to this. And I believe that the reason the ants are coming out, and I was trying to describe this, I said, there's probably something that's common to the cosmos that the ants can sense and that, 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 that is their trigger to go. Mm -hmm. because it's the right time sorry that's like that's a thunderclap i don't know if you hear that no it's one oh it's still going sorry i can't hear okay <laughs> um <laughs> that was the bang moment boom <laughs> yeah the, the 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 uh the ants are sensing this and uh living in india it seemed absolutely bonkers to me that there was an auspicious day a certain mm -hmm. number of times after the moon and the whatever and the planets yeah. in alignment to get married or to have a baby to keep trying mm -hmm. to conceive or or to plant your seeds but i think that somewhere along the line we completely lost the connection to this yeah. common cosmophysical fact must be something non locally like so like th didn't parkamov build uh, a cold neutrino detector yes he like, did and I saw a picture of it, I think, in one of your videos. Uh, I don't have the book. Oh, yes, I do. No, I don't. No, maybe. Like, I and uh, did, did he actually detect any of them? Yes. 
He, he had a, the experiment running for 20, 25 years. He used Cobalt 60 as his uh, element of choice. Why? Because mm -hmm. it has a 5.1 something year half-life. That is far better than the 11 point something year tritium. It's also tritium, far better yeah. because it's a solid and tritium's a gas. So mm -hmm. your chance of interaction of anything is far, far many orders of magnitude higher. So its, it's desire to decay is far higher than almost any other solid beta isotope you can get, basically. Mm -hmm. It's produced in abundance in nuclear reactors by the interaction of neutrons with iron to get your co co cobalt 60, okay? And so uh, this is a waste product that he had access to being a lifelong uh, radiation monitor working for the Soviet nuclear program uh, and so on. So he, he, he basically that is his expertise and thank you that he's going to be our, uh, 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 our advisor for the radiation monitoring for the tritium work for Fukushima, if we can get through the door. Um, because I, don't, I wouldn't want anyone else on planet Earth to be by my side <laughs> uh, uh, in that work. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's the, his understanding of the overall process. Now, it's he detected using diffra diffraction gratings, it's all in space Earth human, that the scale of these cold, condensed cold neutrino condensates, which at the time he referred to as uh, N radiation, is between microns and millimeters. Now, just as light gets partially reflected from a window, which you can look mm -hmm. through and the light can pass through. Yeah. The fact that these are microns to millimeters means solid dense matter, i.e. a metal panelid, which is what he used, can at least partially reflect these uh, uh, oh, yeah, like neutrinos. That. So what he did is he got a 22 centimeter panelid. And if you do the math and you only have a proportion and reflect. So for instance, you've got his sample of cobalt 60 was one millimeter cubed, right? Not very big, right? But it's at the focal point. So how much cold neutrinos would you have from the cosmos when, when all the planets are aligned? Not a lot. When Betelgeuse is right, lensing all of its cold neutrinos towards Earth. Not a lot, okay? But when, when you have a 22 centimeter dish and a proportion, even a small proportion is reflected onto that one millimeter cubed sample, uh, that you get a much higher interaction ratio. And moreover, as I said in one of my last videos before I went on my research tour, the absolute critical thing here is that all normal beta isotopes decay with an energy spread spectrum, okay? It's kind of like, one one and a bit sides of a bell curve you, you know mm -hmm. you've got up to zero kev and and then it goes out to the the the, the finite energy which is if you could go and look at wikipedia and see the energy that's the maximum energy you will get from the beta decay of that beta isotope okay and um, when you do inverse beta decay which is triggered by this n radiation read cold neutrino condensates from the cosmos these relic neutrinos you only get the maximum energy you only get the maximum energy. And that allowed him to discriminate for the maximum energy by putting in, say, aluminium screens. It's all completely detailed in Space Earth Human. I asked him a number of times, is there anything missing from that book? Calculations, theory, the experimental design analysis, nothing. Everyone can use that book to build the detectors and, and be off and running. But not everyone can get access to cobalt 90, plutonium 239, and, and other isotopes that he used, uh, like strontium 90, yttrium 90 transition. Not everyone can get those. But he did the work, and every time you had go through the year, so he's got like 15, 20 years, and cobalt 60 is going up and down and up and down. And what he's seeing is not the spread spectrum, which is naturally coming out. He's seeing the discriminated maximum energy. Now, there will be some maximum energy from the natural decay, but it is a very small proportion of the mm -hmm. natural decay. So by discriminating, he sees a much larger signal effect over the period of time. And by using plutonium-39, which has no beta decay mode, it is an alpha decay mode, he sees no variation across that same year. So he's showing that this is something that's caused by something that's initiating a beta decay. OK, therefore, it can and most likely is a form of neutrino. What is coming from the cosmos? It's cold neutrinos, which can be gravitationally lensed and gravitationally attracted. Now, why between the summer and the winter does the Earth, do you get this variation? I'll tell you why. Because the sun is 98, 99.8 whatever percent of the mass of our solar system. And so any neutrinos coming from the cosmos, cold neutrinos from the birth of the universe, if you believe that, but can also come from supernovas, et cetera, and other mm -hmm. celestial events, 
they are naturally going to be densest. It is, as some authors say, a, a coherent matter condensate through the entire universe. But as I described before, you can have a coherent matter condensate of two bosons in one place, and you can have a coherent matter condensate, which is still consistent with Googleplex uh, uh, bosons in the same location. So it's a little bit weird to think about. It's, it, it's, the whole thing is one condensate in the entire universe, but there are some areas that are more condensate than others, mm -hmm. i.e. they're more equal than others. <laughs> it's a little bit weird to think about. And when the Earth comes closer to the sun, it comes into, in our summer and in the Antipodean spring, sorry, in our spring to, into summer and the Antipodean spring into summer, the, that part of the Earth get, dips into a deeper sea of the physical vacuum concentration of the cold neutrino condensate, okay? See. Which is why seeds germinate in the spring, which is why they germinate on the other side of the planet in the other cycle. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily just a factor about, it, 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 it's your weather changes because of these things, because they interact with electrons, which means they're going to change the charge ratio in the sky, which means you're going to get different amounts of rainfall. Yeah. This, you know, everything is, is linked into this co co cosmophysical factor. And what you're doing in a Lena reactor is you are uh, technologically over a thousand degrees, able to reach this uh, 2.3, uh, uh, 0.23 or 0.25 EV energy uh, uh, enough over a thousand degrees so that you can synthesize these by collisions of dense matter. So two electrons colliding at over a thousand degrees can cause the production of cold neutrinos. Um, hold on, I just need to mute a person. Hi, Jeanne, great to see you. Um, when, when you get these two things, you can create these cold neutrinos, okay? And so so the, the, the part of, sorry, I, I'm sorry for all my questions. You know, but that, that's all like, right. I'm, I'm sure the, the same questions other people have. <laughs> did did Parkimov actually measure in his uh, in his plasma electrolysis uh, um, experiment that he also used that detector to measure the the production of these cold neutrinos well, or did he only like he had a, a, calo a calorie meter so to detect you have to look at the whole you have to look at the whole body of the russian work okay so from from 2009 when strange radiation was established as being something that they really wanted to investigate Mm -hmm. uh, they, they set up this whole research team at Science City in Dubna, it's 50 kilometers north of, uh, of Moscow. And they found that they could create these little birdies uh, from all kinds of different technology, through spinning uh, uh, materials, th through uh, electric plate uh, uh, um, separation, through hydrosonic generators, all kinds of devices created these things. And because they can pass through matter and carry matter, they had to neutralize charge, but they also had to be neutral themselves and they're not neutrons. So uh, because they are uh, of the properties that when they interact with beta isotopes, they cause uh, be, uh, inverse beta decay, they concluded or as a provisionally that they are cold neutrino condensates, which makes them the same as Parkamov's things. Now, when Parkamov is therefore looking for strange radiation coming out of his woodpecker, and he's looking for strange radiation coming out of his 225-day reactor, yeah. the reason he's doing that is that the strange radiation is established to potentially be condensates of cold neutrinos. You understand? So he, yeah. he, he did detect those. His work with Zhigolov did detect those. So he is directly detecting by the presence of... Now, I, I believe that the, 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 um, what we've demonstrated with Hank and, and uh, uh, Dave's work, the, the collaboration that I've had with them, is that we can create this coherent matter from uh, uh, sapphire-like, sapphire, but like doing a lot more of experiments than just trying you to- You mean with, with the tungsten rods? Uh... So, so actually, the, the, it looks like the, the, the copper, uh, the brass plates are very, very good at doing this when you have mm -hmm. small gaps. And what I believe this does, you have electron emissions. This causes uh, uh, um, electron bunching, 
Uh, and this is in several uh, uh, items. If, if you look at what Solin said in 1992, electron function leads to the coherence and forms two solitons of opposite magnetic charges that then cluster and do the transmutation. That's what he said in 1992. In, in 2000, you have this guy Matt, uh, proposing to the nuclear authority that we can create itonic clusters, read microball lightning, read exotic vacuum objects by using a lineac to accelerate um, uh, protons into a beam of bunched electrons, which causes mm -hmm. and forces coherence. You understand? It's all, all the same thing. So you are creating uh, the necessary material to create the overall effect. Uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, for sure, you know. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh... That's all right. If you have any more questions, put your hand up. Does anyone else have any questions? Hi, Simeon. You need to un unmute. Hi. Yeah. So I just Hi. wanted to say, uh, Bob, again, thanks a lot. This was just really fascinating today. Um, I'm giving a presentation to the Society for Scientific Exploration. They're having their conference this week. And uh, John Bakra showed up at one of their meetings in the late 90s before I was a member. And Vittorio Violante uh, gave us a presentation as the keynote speaker in San Francisco in 2016, I believe showing to us how real cold fusion was. That's all he called it. He didn't refer to Leonard. He showed us why so many people haven't been able to reproduce it, which was a lot of fun. Uh, the, the, the crystal grain crystal size of the palladium and that so many labs had not bothered to dope the palladium. It has to be slightly impure. He really took great pleasure in apparently showing this to us uh, about what they did at ENEA to make it work. Uh, so I'm giving a presentation adapted from what I've learned from you over the past year about how this is a natural phenomena, but some of the sociological reasons why it's been ignored, suppressed, ostracized. So I just thought I'd mention that, you know, I'll mention Hestal and lights and some of the things that have interested me, especially what's happening now with this discussion about Tic Tacs and the U.S. Navy, which you did a presentation about a few weeks ago, I believe, in the U.K., about orbs and balls of light. And I'll do my best to show how this is all related to something old that we've Sorry, I've, I've just lost your audio. Can, do you wanna kill your video just for a second so that we can go back to orbs of light and, and kill your video just momentarily? Yeah. Perfect. Oh, so, so step back to yeah, I got you back presentation, so. Hesbalan. Yeah, so I'm going to give a presentation about why cold fusion Leonard isn't something new. It's new to us, perhaps, because we haven't been looking at it for thousands of years, and the institutions we're around have been actively ostracizing it, suppressing it, uh, defunding it, <laughs> so forth. Uh, but why this goes back to, uh, you know, what Ken Shoulders talked about, the Egyptians being able to do this. I, I read through Ken Shoulders' uh, book that you mentioned, his paper. Uh, and again, why, you know, so it continues with some other present presenters to the SSE in the past, uh, but showing that this is something that isn't, it's exotic, but it's not necessarily a new phenomenon. Nature's already doing it. And that's my presentation in a nutshell. I just thought I'd mention that. I think that is the the perfect angle, really. Um, I think when 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 I uh, had the pleasure of meeting Dr. George Eagley, I think that was a seminal moment for me because I, uh, he showed me pictures and videos of what actual natural ball lightning had done, and I believe I saw some. Uh, sorry, one in an event by Chanctonbury Ring when I was about. I guess I must have been about fourteen, fifteen. Um, and I saw this thing come out from the sea and it went round this Neolithic fort, a uh, ring of uh, oak trees. And you can go and look at it. It's on the South Downs in the UK. And you may even be able to dra drag up reports because shortly after that occurred, um, the, the, the trees were burnt all the way around the outside in a big ring. Um, and this actually lies on ley lines, uh, which I think is fascinating. Uh, and the ley lines are meant to connect to all kinds of different uh, um, supposed uh, um, pagan ritual sites, but also uh, 
um, other religions, and when you go back into these, uh, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call them religions, but belief structures, th they they believe these things uh, uh, were related to energy uh, and that you could uh, channel that energy and, and, and so forth. T to be honest, for most of my life, I thought this stuff was complete bonkers, and I've had to reevaluate uh, how I look at things. Uh, um, and 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 be more open-minded. You know, it's been a, it's been a huge adjustment, particularly when I I, I remember the the feeling of reading the 1958 or 59 paper by I think it's Manchester University where they were taking magnetrons and they were using crystals of quartz, and they were um, uh, they they were putting the magnetron beam into the quartz crystal, and it was creating a soliton in there, and it was going backwards and forwards. And as it reflected, it was it was traveling at the speed of sound in the quartz crystal. But as it came back to the other end, it was producing a a, a blip of the original microwave frequency. Of course, it's a transducer. It, it's one of the most fundamental transducers we have to convert electrical into. Uh, um, uh, physical vibration and vice versa. So why would it not uh, um, be able to do this? And the interesting thing was, as they say, when you get up to 10 gigahertz, you're starting to get to the scalar wave oscillation mode of the nucleus of an atom, the dis inter nuclear uh, atom distance. And so um, this is why when I visited the Hutchison lab on the 6th of January, 2018, I proposed that the aluminium bar that I'm discussing had some form of piezo material on the outside and that this would lead to the effect. Little did I know that later I would realize that this would produce coherent matter. What is coherent matter? Well, it's the same thing as superconductivity. And then uh, literally you have the Salvatore Pai papers coming out saying, we coat our aluminium with PZT and this creates room, room temperature and above superconductivity. And it's like I said that in the, the 8th of 6th of January in the video that I shared shortly afterwards. In, 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 so it's like, I, and I was referring to research that I'd seen two uh, in, in late October, late November, I thought, or, or yeah, late November, I think, 2016. And I'd been, it, it, it blew me away. And I was thinking, quartz is in almost everything, it's silicon dioxide. And basically every ancient technology has this. This can transduce. So if you had a lump of magnetite and you have a load of quartz, you can create sound by interfering sound waves and create influence the matter. Or you can create uh, electromagnetic waves that will then produce sound at the frequency of the core of the nucleus of the atom, the, the, the interatomic spacing. So it's not surprising that some of these effects I mean, if you, if you carry that logic forward, it's not surprising that then Salvatore Pi would come out with something like what they're claiming is a valid pattern. And it's the prince, one of the main core principles of, of the high frequency gravitational wave generators and, and, and fusion technology. And so the, all the patents are related and they are related. And I believe those are the four topics that, that, that uh, was mentioned by uh, uh, in the 1996 interview in, in, uh, um, by Christopher P. Tinsley in, in uh, um, uh, Infinite Energy by uh, um, uh, Martin Fleischmann. He said we were researching, re researching four topics at the same time. And I, I'm not so sure, I'm not so, so convinced that it didn't come out of this work. You know, his commission or his instigation of researching that work may have come through these channels, but you, 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 don't, you don't know who's leading you by the nose. You know, <laughs> some, some, sometimes people are being led by things that they, that they don't know what's at play. But he, he said, and, and he very specifically says, you know, the behavior of electrons in metals. Well, this is, this is all about what this is. So yeah, great, and, and obviously, I mean, there's a couple of things that I, I would refer you to. Um, there's Tom Bearden's book here. So uh, it's called Third Alliance, okay? And in Third Alliance, I think I've got it on the page here. Maybe. It says, an example of Russian technology, uh, astonishing Western scientists. This is on page 12 of Third Alliance, Bearden's Third Alliance. Some years ago, coordinating with, coordinating with Western but non-US aerospace firm, I furnished the firm with the names and addresses of some Russian scientists in Moscow, since it was clear from their internet site that the scientists were on the fringes of the KGB energetics weapons programs. 
an excellent European engineer, fluent in Russian, was sent in several times. Several unusual things were demonstrated to him, including transmitting enormous energy down a very thin wire. I've actually published that video that was on news channel in the, in the early 2000s. So you can go and look at it on my Steam it, um, that it's in one of the sublinks at the bottom there. But he then goes on to cold molding or turning metal into liquid at room temperature, pouring it into a mold and then letting it sit and harden all without heating. So uh, th there's more that it says there, but um, so, the point being is that when you compare that to what was told to me when I was visiting Suhas Ralka, and if you go and look at our, our, our SoundCloud, you can hear that whole conversation where we're killing time because we couldn't go and see his equipment. Um, and he, I, I tell him this example, I tell him about John Hutchison, and uh, uh, he tells me about people, humans, that are bending spoons that he tried to video in Israel uh, and he, the electronic equipment wouldn't work around those, those people. But he also then told me about this ball lightning. Ball lightning, <laughs> it's the same thing. This is what the U US Air Force and US Navy was interested in in October 2001. Who's got ball lightning technology? Oh, Ken Shoulders and the US, Navy, the US Air Force from the 1950s and 1960s, right? They're, those are the those are the avenues you should take. Ball lightning was traveling along the side of a, a train carriage and it touched the window, the aluminium window frame of the train carriage. And for 20 minutes, he could manipulate that with his fingers. This is exactly what John Hutchison said. Alex Pizarro was able to pick up this aluminium bar, which had been glowing bright orange, like or yellow orange. It's yellow orange because the exotic vacuum objects are blowing up or condensing actually and emitting 2 keV energy uh, beams, those are ionizing the air and making it look like it is hot, but it's not hot. It looks hot, it's not hot, <laughs> okay? And when, when he went to pick it up moments later, he smeared, and you can also see that on our Steam, the, the Steam It channel, uh, MFMP Steam It channel, and he smeared and left his fingerprint in the aluminium, exactly what was independently and without uh, uh, um, any knowledge by, um, by uh, uh, Dr. Eagley, documented in the uh, um, his books on ball lightning phenomena. And so uh, me meeting Dr. Eagley was absolutely fundamental because it allowed me to see the wood in the trees. That, and, and that's it. And, and, and here we are later down the line and we've got having created beautiful images from a range of technologies which had already been published by Matsumoto before I even realized Matsumoto was the thing. <laughs> and he's calling it microball lightning. So it is a natural effect. It, it is what it is. And it's, it's almost boring for me now, but now it's about let's let's put it to work. You know, you know did what's you, hard. Did, did Sorry, you call it ahead. the Chisenberry ring? Did you call it the Chisenberry ring? Just wanted to just clarify what <laughs> you, that where the tree was. Uh, okay, so there's there's Chisenberry ring, which is a fort, and there's a smaller, there's a smaller fort called Chanctonbury ring. And uh, you you can you can find you I, I don't I, I I was a boy but I, and I wasn't I don't think I was an adult but the the time that this occurred the the lightning bolt came from the 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 the, the, the sea came over the land and then wrapped itself around I, I witnessed the whole thing and it went round and round and round and they lost a lot of the trees and there was burn all the way around the trees so you, you can probably go into the archives uh, maybe the west sussex gazette or something like that and you will find this and whenever that was and it, you can work out how old i was when that happened and that's when i i saw what i believed was ball lightning and in fact in the interview recordings that i have with dr eagley when i had that initial meeting with him in october in 2016 I recounted that story to him. I don't know whether it made the cut, but it's in there and I've got it on video from 2016. So, uh, you know, so it, it, when you, but you don't even recognize it as anything interesting. It's just like my experiences of when I was a boy with my father, he's telling me to look up into the sky. And when I'm recounting, when, and it's like, okay, just like when I show a, a new thing to my children, they don't literally think it's of any significance, just a new thing that they haven't experienced before. It's only later in life when people get set in their ideological ways, essentially it's ideological, right? They can't accept new information. What the hell happens to humans? And then these people who are incapable of accepting new information are the people that are telling the children what is right and wrong. 
That's, it, education is fundamentally flawed from that aspect. It's fundamentally flawed. Because the people in Cape, and that's the brilliant thing with John Hutchison. He spent his life as a child. No offense, John, but you have this wonderful curiosity about nature that just will not die. And that is part of the reason I believe that he was able to do what he was able to do. He doesn't accept someone else telling him that no is the right answer. It's like, well, I'm going to try anyway. <laughs> but, you know, what usually happens is when some people start to develop new things and they become demonstrable so they can just show like what it actually does. And then, you know, the, the rock starts rolling and other people pick it up and more people start using it. And then like, it's sort of an, an organic way of uh, how it evolves and how the world starts using it. So it's hard to fathom if when you say that there are these de demonstrable things that occurred, like the malleability of aluminium or other metals, like the implications for manufacturing and engineering, they are like huge. It's, I, I cannot wrap my head around the fact that these things have been shown and that they somehow are not used. Like well, you need to look at the only PDF, which is one page, that Ken Shoulders censored himself in 2010 called disruptor.pdf. He says, these weapons are ine inevitable. And with the battery power that you have in this smartphone, you can get a device that will give someone cancer that will be untraceable at an untraceable distance, and that they will get an incurable cancer that will kill them in a few weeks. That's one weapon you can make. And then there's another weapon you can make. You can point at cars, and, and the, the, the aluminium parts of the car, like the, the, the wheels, will turn to jelly. You don't have to completely turn them to jelly. You just have to slightly change their tensile strength. And when the car's traveling at, you know, 130 kilometers an hour, you're going to have so, a failure, aren't you? So do you mean that the technology is too dangerous to be widespread? Is that... All kinds of things that they want to protect you from, like sharp pointy things, right? Sharp pointy things and, and, and things that ignite other things. If they've got the information and they can use it at their will, whoever they are, they don't want you to know. And plus, it's so unbelievable. It doesn't matter that Tom Bearden spelt it out in three of his books. And in, in because he tends to repeat himself probably three times in this one book. And this is this is first published 1986. 1986, the same year that Ken Shoulders published Evie A Tale of Discovery, right? Probably the same year that John was showing it. That, that there's a literal fingerprint in a piece of aluminium. You know, it's, it, it is beyond doubt that this technology can do this. Now, the specifics, I think, are related to what... I don't know whether I played a role in, in forcing the, na the Navy to release those patents, but I did look into the camera and say, you, you're running out of time, and I gave them three years. They, ha they had to come clean. I, I think the Air Force had known about a lot of this technology since the, at least the uh, mid-1950s. And that, that Manchester paper shows that you can trans translate between sound and electromagnetic waves. And if that's the case, then you can do this effect. You just, you just have to accept it's possible. It, the, the point about John is he showed what is possible, not necessarily how to do it. And I'm going to announce right now what the name of his book will be. It's called Mr. Possible. <laughs> He's not going to necessarily tell you how to do it or even show you how to do it, but it's possible. I'm holding it in my hands, right? He's shown the way it's for you to work out how it happened. Now, the Russians knew how to do it in the Soviet period. This is not unknown to people, right? And I'm pretty sure that at the top levels in most of the military in the world, this is just bread and butter. They know exactly how it works. Now I want to do, and that's why I'm visiting Slobodan with this. I want to use what it does most, what it wants to do most, which is described in detail by this nuclear expert on his preface, which is to take any material, particularly radioactive material, mash up the nucleons and force it to decay. And since almost every isotope, the vast majority of isotopes that come from fissioning of uranium-235 are beta isotopes. Mm. 
to get them to stability, uh, an abundant source of cold neutrino condensates is just wonderful. And as I've said, you only need to go over a thousand degrees. Well, it's not doing it over a thousand degrees in the way you think about it. The electron temperature created by the mazing of the OH radicals, the self-mazing, is in the, the killer electron volts. It's not a thermal process. It's a killer electron volt process. You need to think of it differently. And so it's, it's way above the energy necessary. So these electrons are going smack at way more necessarily energies than they need to produce cold neutrinos. So they produce them by the shitloads. Mm -hmm. And then they condense. And then they produce the exact things we saw on, on the 10 yen coin, on the, on the uh, tungsten welding rod. Transmutation, Lena in a can, instantaneous cold nuclear transmutation. In fact, as I said before, coherent nuclear transmutation. And if you look at Vysotsky, you mentioned, a couple of people have mentioned Vysotsky. Vysotsky, the number of times I've heard him say, coherent correlated states in his, his presentations is beyond belief. You can mm -hmm. go and look at any IC, ICF presentation that he's said, it, coherent correlated states. And I felt like a complete idiot when I finally realized that he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> It is staring you in the face. He's saying it over and over again. He, he, I, I remember sitting next to him at the back of the auditorium in, in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and someone's going on about stuff on their presentation. And he's, he, he, I don't know whether he's autistic and there's nothing wrong with that. But he's muttering to himself with clear and deep frustration. He, he's listening to the person. He goes, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> he's talking to himself because... And, 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 and sometimes I feel like that. I, I, I'm probably going to end up like it. <laughs> because, and this is the beauty of trying to do this tritium experiment. I've seen, and you've seen, the amount of time we exposed that tungsten welding rod. Mm -hmm. You've seen what happened. We turned indium at less than the thickness of an Asian human hair to a jelly-like state like jelly aluminium right like to a jelly like state it, it should have melted if you had this 2000 or 3000 degrees thermal temperature no it's glowing at incandescent it's glowing like a tungsten filament 100 watt light bulb right but it's a piece of jelly flapping in the wind something's very odd that's going on there the temperature the color temperature you're looking at is way above the deep composition of indium nitride and in, in, in india indium oxide way above the decomposition temperature and it's just flapping in the breeze with this with this hho there's a mars gas on it something's much more interesting is going on and i believe it's because slobodan really showed the key when he observed with his spectrometer only oh only oh what, what are you showing me there oh you've got a sheet of indium great perfect i was going to ask you to get some in maybe i already did but i'm going to bring the other part, uh, one, of, one of the parts of the tungsten welding rod, which we tested with the Mars gas, because we already know that it had just a bit of tungsten in it, some thorium and some other trace, right? So we've already tested before. I have the bit that, that is exposed to a Mars gas, and there's a bit that's not exposed to a Mars gas or, or whatever. So we're going to test it with the HHO, and maybe even if we can split it, uh, some D, 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 deuterium enriched HHO. And if we see exactly the same thing with you, it's a slam dunk. HHO is a Lena in a can. Brown's gas is Lena in a can. It's instantaneous, on the go transmutation capability. It's it just, and no wonder they wanted to shut it down. No wonder the Chinese wanted to, to back it. I, I don't know. I mean, if you look at Rex research, that first page, it says the number one way to remediate nuclear waste is using Brown's gas. And in 1992, he demonstrated in front of senators uh, uh, the fact that within seconds, using aluminium shavings, which are a paramagnetic, high electron density, highly conductive material, which we know interacts a lot with these things. We know it does. <laughs> it's not guesswork. Um, can create a lot of these clustering. And the clustering binds onto what? It binds onto the iron that he had in there. Why? Because iron is ferromagnetic. And then when iron goes over its Curie point around the 900 and whatever degrees, it releases instantaneously all of these magnetic monopoles that then self-cluster, cause a huge flash, and the radioactive material is gone. 
Just like that. Done. That's how it works. And he proved it in 1992. And in his 1980s patents, I think, he's saying that most material ends up as carbon. Shame, it's, it's a shame that he didn't share the data and just made that statement. But then it was, much, as I've said before, and I've argued on his behalf, he's deceased, but it, he didn't have the equipment available to him to be able to conduct the sort of tests that, 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 we, with, that even we have today. You know, we, we can get this equipment without having to go to the military lab. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you, there are ways and means to get this testing done. And so... The, the observation of carbon that you are seeing in these carbon sheets and these carbon filaments here that we see all over that Indian that's exposed to Amasa gas. And it literally looks identical. The carbon films look identical. They're like carbon folded sheets or, or, or carbon crystals. It's, it, it, you know, it's just, it, it's exactly the same. And, 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 and um, Slobodan has observed the same thing. Maybe Slobodan, give me a break and he, he, he can, uh, Talk, talk a little bit for those that don't know about the, the carbon types that he's observed physically in his uh, testing. Uh, well, uh, the experiment I did, uh, well, a few years ago now, I was with the, uh, uh, with the um, carbon, carbon road and the oxyhydrogen gas, HHO they call it now. So um, I made a, a small article about this and you can find it on ResearchGate if you want. And it was very interesting because it was, uh, as Bob said, it was something that uh, <laughs> uh, you don't expect to, to find out when you make contact uh, between carbon road and oxyhydrogen gas. So um, the thing was that um, in essence, I made the analysis of the carbon road with the uh, uh, gas chromatography and some other uh, uh, sample analysis. And we have, uh, it was like 99.8% pure carbon and the 0.2% was, I don't know, maybe 30 elements, chemical elements in very, very small quantities. And after the the oxy hydrogen gas, uh, plasma of the oxy hydrogen gas, uh, we arrived at something like maybe seven, eight, seven or eight elements, chemical elements like uh, aluminium, carbon, oxygen, and I don't know. Uh, I don't know by. by, <laughs> by the, the typical uh, also. Typical yeah. seven, eight elements that we, we have uh, in uh, all these experiments for massa gas or brown gas. So, um, but the, the thing is that these elements like uh, were like, I don't know, uh, 1000 fold more uh, uh, per, percent per, per mass uh, be between the beginning and after the experiment. So it was uh, like, I don't know, uh, 1800 time more elements percentage of uh, mass. So it was very interesting because uh, if you calculate all the mass you have in these small samples, you, you cannot arrive this uh, quantity of the, uh, the elements. And all these elements were, uh, as Bob said, uh, small, small spheres. And in fewer samples, uh, uh, I did the analysis with the EPFL, by the way, uh, you can see the small sphere and you have small plume coming out from it, uh, uh, which are uh, composed with different elements. And the first one was exactly <laughs> in carbon. So, um, and other things were like uh, uh, some sort of uh, crystal, uh, crystal arrangement, I would say, a crystal sort of, uh, I don't know, diamonds. <laughs> uh, uh, look like and well there was a lot of things uh, very uh, interesting in this uh, these experiments so uh, i think just to clarify the, the 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 spheres were firstly they were lead 
they were in these same kind of like micron or whatever thickness. Uh, uh, there was a specific kind of thickness. This was intimated to me that in um, uh, Klimov's experiments, he was often finding hollow spheres. And there are hollow spheres recorded by uh, um, Matsumoto in those water discharges. Right. This is definitely something they produce. I, I believe that that is the coherent matter sheath and that uh, um, it gets uh, to a certain intensity and whatever intensity it's at when, when the coherent matter ends, that is the element you get. But nine times out of 10, it ends up producing carbon. Now, right. we, we can observe, for instance, if you think of a sapphire producing the, what I believe are coherent matter, they call them tufts, but they were called uh, balls of fire uh, in 2000 in, 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 in Japan, uh, in the other paper that I've referred to in the past in fusion technology. Uh, fusion technology or uh, anyway plasma fusion or something in in japan um they 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 cut caster they uh, like likes like and they self-organize and then when they get to a certain level of intensity they form a sphere now if you can imagine that you've had one of these spheres as an extremely small micro ball lightning and then you get more of them falling like those tufts on sapphire and then they come and form one double layer that produces another skin and that produces another layer of carbon. And then it goes again, and it goes again, and it goes again. And so you end up building this structure. The interesting thing is that you see exactly the same type of, uh, almost like a, a macro buckyball type diamond faceted structure in the analyzed meteorite of Chelyabinsk. Right, right, exactly. And in the Chelyabinsk, what have you got? You've got a thing re-entering the atmosphere and it's getting extremely hot. And right. it is likely to be interacting with water in the atmosphere. So it's everything is there to create the coherent matter necessary. There isn't the pressure. We, we're not in this kind of like ultra pressures environment where you should be creating diamonds. It's in the micro state of these uh, co co uh, coherent matter structures that then self collapse and lead to this production of, of, of the diamond. The other thing that's very interesting, which you haven't mentioned, but I, I, I found it particularly interesting. I think in one of your videos, you had a, a, um, a, a, a filter, perhaps something like this welding filter here, which I should probably bring with me if you haven't already got it, but I think you have. Right, I have <laughs> and, it, and, yeah. and you were observing through this with a video camera and you were seeing these, seeing these spheres, which were you could imagine they were the things that you're observing in the cold material, but they didn't just stay there and they didn't respect the intensity of the gas jet impinging upon them. They would build and build and there would be one up here and one down here and then it would jump from here over to here. It would jump around on the surface. And you know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of Hutchison effects. Okay. where you would get something on the table and it would jiggle yeah. and it would jiggle and then suddenly it would jump to another location. Right. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the movie I made, uh, I mean, the, the uh, recording I made with uh, the camera was uh, with a filter, uh, filter at uh, 375 nanometers uh, wavelength. Right. So uh, I could see the, uh, you know, almost in the UV, uh, so you can uh, see really the uh, uh, first the small bits, like small bubbles of energy, going here and there on the on the surface of the the, uh, the electrode. And the second thing is, uh, which for me is also very interesting, is that can I just uh, pause on that before you move on to the second thing. Yeah, it looks like if you can imagine polystyrene beads that are highly statically charged exactly. and they literally jump around like that and when exactly. you think of it like that that's kind of what it probably is carry on possibly yeah it's possible because of either magnetic or highly electrostatic exactly. magnetic charges are i mean since we know these things can produce magnetic charges and it's spelt out by solar and how that occurs and, it, it, you know, everything from that point onwards, and I mentioned the, the uh, Aritzkev and, and the Chernobyl reactor, it's right. reasonable to think that it might be magnetic charges. And what you are observing in the Hutchison effect with the things jiggling and then jumping is the same kind of magnetic orientation. Magnets, if you get them close, they'll start shifting, they're shifting, and then they'll jump to a new location. And, and, and it looks like that. But our own frame of reference when we're looking at it is... I can only really describe it with people that have witnessed 
there's the static reorientation of statically charged polystyrene balls. That's the a charge, but but in this case, it's magnetic charge. Carry on. Right. Yeah. Uh, the second thing was interesting. The video we can see is the, um, the without the movie, I didn't saw any fume come from the electrode while I was uh, working with the oxyhydrogen. Uh, but what is interesting in video, you can see is you know, art just disappearing, you know, uh, just it doesn't burn, but the, the small parts disappearing from the from the electron. And uh, it's, we, we, we talked about it's not sublimating, but uh, it's some, maybe it's something with the, you know, um, electric, uh, electronic, uh, you know, structure or the the uh, bonding bonding between the atoms so that it was just you know uh, it, it could be converted to light and leptons light and leptons uh, which would not be unsurprising it could also uh, be uh, going into a neutral package and departing and trans transporting that material elsewhere and yeah. in, in the lion reactor on the fused quartz we've actually observed spheres appearing inside the quartz and and even magnetic spheres, like there's there's one photo that I shared where the you had the the these magnetic sphere half in and half out of of the quartz, like mm -hmm. it's appeared there. It hasn't fractured the quartz, right, but it's like right, yeah. in space time, like a normal ball lightning or tuft would do, fifty percent in. And then it has two more spheres that are magnetically chained onto it. So it's almost like the same structure dumped part of its payload in three locations, but one of the locations is half in and half out of the quartz. Exactly. So, uh, so there's there's that, but then there's also the potential that it's producing gases, uh, uh, potentially helium and uh, or protein, as in protons, uh, and protons could then be mixed up with whatever's coming out of the gas and 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 be lost that way. And uh, all of the data suggests that protons are readily produced in Lena. You get several people have reported excess hydrogen, <laughs> and uh, this is again what Langmuir observed, I believe in the 1910s uh, and so forth. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. But helium, of course, if you're getting helium, that's not going to then react because it's a noble gas and uh, uh, it's then going to depart, which is why which is why we need to do the test as soon as we can with Alan Goldwater because he has a residual, residual gas analyzer that can observe all of those light element gases. It, right the way up into, I think, mass... He can do up to mass 90, I think, or 98 or something. So we can observe pretty much any of the, any noble gas that might be synthesized. Mm. That's the, 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 the problem with all these experiments uh, I do, or, or a lot of people do, is the, the lack of, you know, um, uh, measurement equipment or analysis. But don't worry, we, we have a solution. It's within our, our, our thing now, whether we have to go to, uh, uh, get a, another HHO generator in the US or whether we can transport the device to the Browns device. Th mm. This would have all been done last year uh, had there not been the sniffles going around and a lot yeah. of paranoia by people that like to control people. Um, but uh, anyway, um, it, it will come to pass and that's the important thing. <laughs> so does anyone else have any questions? We've got, we've got about uh, 16 minutes before we close out the call. Um, anyway, any questions of Slobodan uh, first? Is anyone awake? <laughs> okay, good, John. Excellent. So, uh, Rianderthal is saying some things here. The Electron Universal Group posits another polar alignment uh, period. Yes, well, there's... Uh, okay, well, I, I know, having spoken to uh, the lead physicist and, and the lead of, of uh, the um, Sapphire Group, that they uh, are considering... Uh, neutrinos in their work and uh, I believe they're even considering it, or have built a Parkamorph cold neutrino detector. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, when I wouldn't agree to sign an NDA, they, they, they were not happy for me to be an, a free advisor to them. I said, I don't mind being free, but I'm not going to sign an NDA. <laughs> um, so that was the end of that conversation. But uh, um, uh, the three body cold neutrino flux effects is the same extreme implications in the velocity. I'm sure, I'm sure it does, Rianderthal. That, that is a good point. Uh, 
okay, okay, okay. Uh, oh, yes, I remember. Thanks. Uh, how important is the difference between the two? Into okay, all right. Um, extreme, yes, extreme. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, if you if you actually Reanderthal, if you haven't seen extreme interactions uh, from the Vega experiments, you can see how these particles interact near instantaneously and not at all, and it, it is a very non-linear field effect um, that is created. So there's, there's a hundred percent effect up to an almost instantaneous boundary, and then outside of that, there's zero effect at all. <laughs> and you can see the you can see this particle co this coherent matter coming around here and you can see another one coming in and it gets within the zone and it literally gets swept up into it or another one it literally does 180 degree orbit orbit and then and gets swept up into it it's, it's all there and 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 it just it's really breathtaking to see the visual sequence of events that these things create um and it's just it's just it's just beautiful yeah th there's going to be effects on biology reanderful uh, absolutely uh uh, and well, I, 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 having said that, um, biology has evolved with this, and in fact, it's completely inherent to biology. So the very fact that chickens can convert that calcium, uh, get that calcium from the potassium, and the fact that that you get the same kind of reactions going on with the Vysotsky and, and Kolinova uh, uh, biological transmutation of cesium one thirty seven, and also of magnesium uh, fifty five to iron fifty seven with deuterium. Um, the fact that these things can occur in biology and also the seed germination potassium calcium ratios means that something is going on in biology. And I would argue that it is coherent matter because coherent matter can occur at any temperature. Now, what is good about the human body is it has a very, very consistent temperature. And I think that's absolutely critical to biology. Uh, 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 yes, I'm sure it's all over the archaeology. And uh, what I didn't mention about my trip to the UK was uh, I went and did uh, some visits to some archaeological sites, which I've wanted to visit for two and a half years, two to two and a half years. Uh, and uh, I was absolutely blown away by what I recorded at those sites. And so that will be a presentation in the coming months. Um, but it's just breathtaking. It, if they didn't know how this technology works, someone who was doing the carving, um, someone who was doing the carvings uh, was an incredible remote viewer. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> um, because what you are seeing in these carvings is at, we have already shared exactly the same thing as being observed uh, in these various systems. And and I, what I want to do is spend some time just taking the, the SEMs and, and, and the uh, uh, macro and microscopic images and literally overlaying them over these carvings and the correlation would just be, it just, just be ridiculous. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I can already see it. So uh, before I even get into Photoshop. So um, uh, I think that's going to be a, a really uh, special thing. And, and uh, these particular um, series of carved uh, um, uh, structures, um, they've never been explained. Uh, there's, there's no adequate explanation. There's, uh, there's explanations for things that can clearly be seen as an anthropomorphic and, and tools that you would have at the time. But these other things, which were important to their uh, uh, belief of how the world worked uh, and the, the, their symbols of power, um, there, there's no adequate explanation as for why they would draw them in a particular way, and, and uh, but I think there will be, and I think that that ex adequate explanation is going to cause a little bit of a problem for people uh, um, as we move forward, um, because you could, you, there's only two options. One, well, there's three options. There's one option where they were taught these things and they were part of their history, and it was just a bit of Chinese whispers, but the symbols carried forward. Two is they invented it themselves and codified it. Or three, they remote viewed it and codified it because the person that was good at remote viewing was good at also knowing when to plant the seeds and when someone, when a volcano or something or was going to blow up it, and it was always getting it right. So they just trusted him on, on these particular things when he said they were important. So there's three options. They were taught it, they discovered it, or, or they remote viewed it. That's the, the, there's the only option. But what you are seeing 
in my view, is a representation of this technology. Uh, and uh, it's never been adequately explained. So I'm, I'm quite excited to uh, put that material out to you. And you'll see me in front of these things and, and talking about them and, and so forth. So um, yeah, uh, it's very special. Okay, so uh, we have uh, nine minutes. Any, anyone got some last questions? Uh, either in the chat or... Um, more, more on Ormus. Uh, okay, so um, I'll give you something on Ormus. In 2018, in February, I tested two samples of Ormus. <clears throat> Bear with me a second. I've got one on the shelf here somewhere. Somewhere? somewhere? Have I? Uh, somewhere I haven't. I, I know I've, I've got, okay, so I have four samples. Uh, three of them were made in Hungary, and uh, I have one of them. I, I, maybe I don't have it in here either. Maybe I'll put them all together. I, I, I'm being too organized. Oh, no, here we go. So this is one gram, uh, 1.2 grams of monoatomic gold, uh, and this is one which, this might be really pure. Uh, the other two have a slightly higher sodium concentration from less washes, okay? So I, was rece I received this from... Um, a guy in um, Hungary uh, via Dr. George Eagley in, uh, I think late 2017 or in 2017. Uh, I bought for comparison, the leading brand of claimed Ormus. And then I put both of them under the SEM. Uh, I, I will, this, this will be a whole paper presentation, but what I can say is uh, just right off the bat, um, the, the claimed Ormus from the leading brand that's available to buy in the world tested is like calcium carbonate with some rubbish on it. Um, and they were large flakes of whatever. I don't know. <laughs> they, they were large flakes, but, you know, I'm not, not convinced that's anything. Uh, if it helps people, it's pink in colour. Um, this tested... And uh, I, I won't give the punchline, but um, uh, what I will say is we had to remove the EDS uh, head and go as far as we could take this uh, T-scan in, and they are nanoparticles. They, they are, and even at that, it looked like fluffy clouds. That is, is just amazingly fine stuff. <laughs> um, so I actually don't know who produced this, but I do know that. Um, uh, Hungary for a long time was uh, had the largest Jewish community uh, in Europe, and in fact, I think it, at one point it was the largest contiguous Jewish community in the in the world uh, in Budapest. Um, and uh, they were very good at producing this stuff. I don't know whether that came down the uh, uh, the community uh, knowledge was transferred, but I do know that when I was with um, MFMP director. Um, uh, Alan Goldwater in, in North Moravia testing uh, Mi-356's equipment. I had uh, a discussion with him about monatomic gold and could this be related because um, David Hudson said when you heated monatomic gold up, you ended up by getting more heat out than you put in. Um, and that sounds very Leonard to me. Um, and that's in one of his writings. Uh, and so uh, I was talking to him and he, and he just said off the cuff, um, oh, uh, you know my name because he was actually, he, he was interested in coming on the trip because his, um, his uh, uh, relatives, his historical relatives were from uh, uh, Krakow and we were intending to go there for, for a break from our experimentation. Um, and uh, he, he said, oh, you, you know my, my name is Goldwater. Well, that's because my family used to make edible gold. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, it's crazy. Like, we've got three directors of the MFMP here. And, like, one, one of them's a, a Jewish person who used to make edible gold in his bloodline. I, I'm, I'm from a, a, a senior Masonic family, and, and the other one's a Mormon. I thought it's like, and who believes the space aliens are going to come down and collect us all one day. <laughs> it's like, what a team. <laughs> it's like, it, it, uh, I, I wouldn't call it a, a Marvel comic, but at that moment, it seemed a little bit freaky. 
Um, so yes, um, I will do a paper and presentation on the analysis of the two types of Ormus, but um, I can tell you that uh, uh, David Hudson was right as far as that I have been able to do analysis, analysis on that, what I believe is genuine uh, monatomic gold. Um, Uh, I, 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 well, I, I don't know whether it was actually uh, um, monatomic gold. So Rientel says, have you heard that uh, Petri uh, found tons of it in Sinai? What I, what I was aware is that that is the claim that's made by David Hudson in some of his talks, and that a white substance was found uh, 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 it, it, by uh, Petri, I think it is. Um, uh, but I don't know whether anyone actually analyzed that because that, I believe, Chain, it was at a different time to uh, when it was like prior to I might have got my timelines wrong but I think it's a uh, Simon Hain okay your battery's dying bye bye <laughs> you'll see the rest of the recording is there's only uh, three minutes to go uh, that, yeah so da David Hudson was a source so it, 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 David uh, Hudson talks about the what is it and uh, the interesting thing about David Hudson's analysis and his conclusions is that he said that if you take Ormus and you don't have cancer, it has an anti-cancer effect. If you take Ormus and you already have cancer, it promotes the uh, cancer, so it can accelerate your cancer. And this is the exact same story that is given, uh, that is derived from the tests of rats exposed to strange radiation. Okay, so if you expose rats to strange radiation, these are rats that are predisposed to getting cancer, and then you fire gamma rays at them, and then you expose them to strange radiation, that it will accelerate their cancer. Okay, if you take rats uh, and you expose them to strange radiation first, and then you expose them to gamma radiation, they have resistance against getting cancer. This is exactly the same story between what David Hudson said almost was like and uh, uh, the experimental evidence of uh, and as I said earlier in this talk and um, uh, strange radiation is effectively cold neutrino condensates uh, at least in several understandings so what it seems to be able to do and this is true also for instance if you if you take um uh, uh, the water that comes, I talked about this in a previous presentation, you take the water that comes out of Shishkin's cavitator, the cavitator will kill you if you're next to it for an hour. The, the flux of strange radiation will kill you in about an hour. But if you take the water that's been uh, produced and you feed that to plants, the plants germinate and they're stronger and they, they grow faster. So in my view, the oxygen that's dissolved in the water has captured a very large amount of uh, the synthesized cold neutrino condensates and biology uses that in coherent matter transmutations to germinate and, and grow faster. But anything that wants to divide will use these condensates to accelerate their growth. And what is cancer? Cancer is cells that don't have an off switch. So if you give it something that doesn't have an off switch, uh, 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 gasoline, it's going to blow up, isn't it? So that everything is explained and is consistent between the observations of David Hudson and the Russian research on the interaction of strange radiation with, with, with uh, uh, mice and before and after exposure. So the, the explanation I would have for the mice is that the, the, the interaction of the strange radiation with the mice's uh, femoral uh, white blood cell production, which is one of the, there's two areas of the body that produce a lot of cells very quickly. Uh, one, one is in the bone marrow uh, and the other one is your hair and nails. And this is why you lose your hair and nails when you get radiation exposure because they divide quick and you're trying to kill cancer cells that divide quick. And so you lose your hair and your, uh, uh, well, not your nails so much, but your hair um, because the cells are dividing very quick in, in your hair. And, and, and so um, that's, that's how radiation therapy works in that instance. But when you, uh, um, you pre-expose the rats, they produce a lot of the white cells. So when they get exposed to the uh, gamma radiation subsequently, they, the, there's an abundance of white blood cells that then can kill the, the cancers, the, the, the nascent uh, uh, cancers, okay? So it, it, by the same logic, that's how Ormus is benefiting people prior to having cancer, right? It, it's a cancer preventative. And since if you don't die of anything else, you're going to die of cancer ultimately because you're going to have some errors, it will prevent the, the cancer dying, okay? It, it, it will prevent your death or reduce. That would be the logical argument that you can draw from the data that, that's been had. 
Now, uh, when I was also at Sochi, I think it, the, there was a young woman there I called, uh, um, I can't remember her name, but she was work, working with some Russians and they found that um, if they did corona discharge into water and then used that water, uh, sorry, they were, they, the Russians were working with a German uh, group. If you did corona discharge into water, it produced water that then when it was fed to seedlings, germinated faster and produced uh, stronger, uh, more disease resilient uh, uh, um, shoots. And we know that corona discharge produces tritium. Uh, which, uh, which uh, by by the work of the former La Los Alamos National uh, Labs researcher um, uh, uh, Tom Clater, and and so we we know 100% in my view that this is producing coherent matter, and corona discharge is also what Savatama, Savatamova showed did transmutation uh, in her ICCF 23 presentation. So corona discharge, in my view, is getting. A, an amount of electrons into a bunch state, which produces the coherent matter, which will which will produce these uh, uh, cold neutrino condensates, and uh, uh, and they will be doing this work. And so th th there we go. The whole whole thing is completely consistent between the claims and observations of David Hudson, the claims of observation in, in uh, exposure of water uh, uh, exposed to. Uh, uh, means or that would otherwise do Lena reactions. And I believe it's the oxygen dissolved in the water. And I've argued that uh, Sundaresan and uh, uh, Bo Bokris's work in the 90s, trying to replicate uh, um, the inventor of the macrobiotic diet, uh, George Ossawa's experiments of carbon arc underwater, they found that if there was no oxygen dissolved into the water, they did not see the production of iron. They interpreted that it's because oxygen is the thing that produces the iron. It becomes part of the iron. I am interpreting that now, given all the evidence since, that it's the oxygen that if it's not in the water, it, it, it can't uh, 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 do the, uh, the collecting of the production of the magnetic monopoles leading to the transmutation. So I'm, I'm coming at it from a, a different angle. I'm saying you, you what they did is they boiled the water to remove, remove the dissolved oxygen, and then they saturated it with nitrogen such that it can't absorb, absorb any oxygen. And this is why I believe that um, the Amasa gas is, is superior, because uh, the Amasa gas is producing uh, oxygen and hydrogen. But if it, 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 because the plates are vibrating, uh, any oxygen that's produced doesn't get to form a macro bubble it is automatically forced to be dissolved into the water. And then the water is mixed by the process of the vibrating plates. And, and Amaza said, and I, when I was with him setting up the vibrator systems, he was very sure to make sure that the, there was pure, the proper mixing of the water. And it, from experience, it, he believes that, that that does the transmutation better with just the vibration case. Um, but I believe that that is because the any oxygen that is synthesized in the electrolyzed version of it, the amazo gas generating version of it, leads to oxygen that is then forced to dissolve into the water that then produces the ability to create the magnetic monopole clusters and produces a higher uh, quality of the dense gas that you require uh, that does all the special stuff. Does that answer your question, Riandertal? Uh, Paul, uh, do you think uh, multiplication, stimulation, secondary beta emission can play a factor in the production of cold neutrinos? Do you think multi, multi paction stimulated secondary beta emission, second, stimulated secondary beta emission? Well, uh, well, firstly, if you've got a beta particle and it's at high energy, uh, if that's colliding into any solid dense matter, uh, and uh, its its kinetic energy is high. It's going to produce some cold neutrinos. I, ideally, you want to be producing them in in a self organizing cluster, uh, which these solitons are, and a self pinching cluster that forces whatever it is into a denser and denser orientation. I'm not sure I got your question there, but I hope that uh, helps answer. So we've run a little bit over time. Is there anyone else that wants to ask a question? Otherwise, we'll we'll call it a night because it's uh, gone midnight here. Okay, well, thank you guys for your time this evening. Uh, thanks for joining us, Slobodan, and uh, thanks for getting the Indium. That's going to be useful. Um, 
remind me before I go to bring the tungsten just so I don't forget it <laughs> and maybe I'll bring a 10 yen coin and and uh, and that'll probably mean I'll never be able to go to uh, Japan so I'll let you do the test um, <laughs> um oh yeah well th that's great so you got some tungsten as well so uh we, we can do a, a, a test with a different sample as well. But I, I think having the same sample and you exposing on a different area, it means it is its own control. Um, and so, uh, okay, that's great. Uh, so cheers, Riandathor, great questions. I hope that I've um, given some new insight onto um, uh, uh, Ormus for you. I, I think that um, when you see the data from the uh, SEM analysis of the leading brand of claimed Ormus and actual Ormus uh, produced in Hungary, um, I think you're going to be a bit shocked at the difference. Um, and so uh, <laughs> I would love to know how they made that particular stuff. I actually gave samples of that in, in Boulder, Colorado to seven different independent and government labs. Uh, and uh, I haven't had data back from any of them, but this is the story um, that we seem to get. Um, want, want to send you a day disc as fan mail. <laughs> how? Oh, I don't even know what that means, um, but uh, <laughs> maybe I should. <laughs> um, Send a message to connect through uh, um, uh, our historical archive site uh, through the contact form there at, at uh, um, uh, I can't remember it now. Um, oh, God. Uh, <laughs> uh, what's it called now? Someone type it into the box, uh, uh, quantumheat.org. If you go to quantumheat.org, uh, that's great. I'll be interested in that. So quantumheat.org and... Um, the on the contact the contact form you can send a message via there and even an attachment if it's not too big i think it does up to five megabytes um uh, you could send a link to a download for the disc or, or something like that and i'll get it so thank you very much everyone i will post the recording of this video uh to the uh, mfmp youtube channel when i get a copy of it and uh don't believe the hype get on with your lives of normal the sniffles is over